Um, yeah, so basically I'm just going to share some thoughts and leave you with some unanswered questions. Well, questions that you can take away and think about. So I, I know quite a few faces here. There are some that I don't know. So I don't know really why... If I say anything that doesn't make a lot of sense, because it's Buddhist gobbledygook, just ask somebody else later. <laughs> Especially the people with these things around their neck. They just ask them next week. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I, as I say, I'm not quite sure whether some of you might be a bit newer to Buddhism. So Anyway, um, so this is based on a talk that I gave about two months ago to, this sounds very grand, a senior teachers meeting of the European Buddhist Union. Sounds very grand, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, um, and the theme of that particular meeting was Buddhism in Contemporary Society. And they asked me if I would give one of the talks and talk a little bit about Tree Ratna's approach to contemporary society. So just to start with complete um, transparency, I do not believe that Buddhism is a path of personal development. That's my first statement. I think that's a waste of time, frankly. Uh, I know that for some people that's what might bring us into Buddhism. It wasn't what brought me into Buddhism. I was really uninterested in a path of personal development. And fortunately, somebody pointed out to me that I needed one, so I kind of worked on that. And my, the other thing to say is that my own starting point was uh, kind of politics and social justice, really. So that was kind of the background that I'd had when I came across Buddhism as a young woman. I was in my 20s. I was 25 when I stumbled through the door of the Glasgow Buddhist Centre. So I'd been studying social ju theories of social justice and uh, it seemed that they were broadly divided into two approaches. So this is a long time ago. I think theory of social justice has changed a lot since the 70s. But when it was to start with the individual and then build your theory of social justice up from the unit of the individual. And the other one's a more structural approach which looked at uh, analysing co the complexity of society and looking at them through subclasses like class, gender, sexuality, etc. So starting with the individual meant that you would end up with theories of universal freedom, individual freedom, and duty. That would be the kind of main way of looking at that. And, uh, it, you know, it had its, its um, advantages, but it was never really what attracted me. I was much more attracted to looking at social justice through the lens of class, gender, sexuality, etc., um, I mean, in a way, that you could say that a just and stable society probably needs both. So, but my approach was definitely the latter. Um, yeah, so that's just a little bit of background. So when I met the Dharma, when I met Buddhism, I was very much fired up by the ideas of social justice and by the need to change society. Uh, I had actually come across Buddhism before, years before. I had a teacher, a drama teacher, when I was in my teens, who actually later I discovered was a member of the Western Buddhist Order, Tri Ratna, but she wasn't at that time. And uh, she talked very much about Buddhism. It was quite present in how she taught drama. But frankly, it left me with the idea that Buddhism was for navel-gazing and for people who were no activists, and I considered myself an activist, so I wasn't particularly interested in something that meant sitting around going om. For, <laughs> it seemed very boring, really. <laughs> I believed that the world needed changing. I believed that there was... Well, I believed, I mean, I was very aware of poverty, war, racism, sexism, homophobia. They were the battles that I was setting out to fight. I wanted to end the world's suffering. Um, and... So when I, so then I got to this point where I realised that that was all very well and good, but I could never change the world unless I changed myself. You know, looking back, I could say I realised I was part of the problem rather than part of the solution, although I couldn't have used such terminology at that point in time. But uh, I'd been reflecting on that, and then I thought, 
I've got to change my life, basically. Because uh, also I was, yeah, I was doing a lot of drugs, a lot of sex and a lot of rock and roll. It was the 70s after all. And uh, I was thinking I need to change my life. And then I saw a poster that said, change your life. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> so I phoned up this, um, the number that was on this poster and uh, this guy said to me, Oh, I just come up tonight and you can have your dinner with us. That's Glaswegian. It meant just come up and you can have your dinner and, you know, come to the class. So it was an order member called Ajita who probably none of you here would have ever met. He died quite a long time ago. Anyway, he was the centre chairman in the Glasgow Buddhist Centre. So if I went up there to have uh, have my dinner and go to this first night of a a dharma, what was effectively a dharma course. And it was four taped lectures that were being played, which were a series called Buddhism for Today and Tomorrow. So that was my introduction. And it was the perfect introduction for me because it was talking about the need to change the world. So I thought, OK, I'll sign up for this. And um, I, I recently wrote the preface of, the, of a volume of Sangharachita's complete works that are coming out next year about the Bodhisattva ideal and um, I just copied a little bit I cut and pasted myself so I quite liked it <laughs> so it said when hearing of the Bodhisattva ideal I felt my world shift and I saw my future path stretch out ahead of me I've never wavered on that the need to change the world to put to rest the suffering I could see around me was finally held within an ideal more profound more challenging and more beautiful than anything I had ever encountered in religion or in politics before. So that was my kind of introduction to, to Buddhism. And uh, is everybody familiar with what the Bodhisattva ideal is? Is there anybody for which that... Great. So the idea that Buddhism isn't just a path of personal development, but something which can actually change the world, which can alleviate suffering in a broader sense... I was also very interested in collective suffering rather than just personal suffering. I had plenty of personal suffering. You know, my life uh, is a bit of a horror movie. and uh, But I wasn't really that interested in working with that because I thought, in some way, because I was interested in the more structural approach to society, the more systemic approach, I thought, there's no, in a way, if you just try and alleviate one person or a few people, you don't really change anything you know, society needed to be changed at a much more structural level. And one of the first things I came across was a book, somebody gave me a book um, about Dr. Ambedkar, who was, um, many of you will have heard of Dr. Ambedkar, he was an Indian uh, who uh, was, was, grew up in the, um, what, became, what was known as the untouchable caste, the Dalit caste in India, and uh, he'd been thinking very deeply about the roots of caste. He became a politician. In fact, he ended up writing the constitution for modern India, which is pretty extraordinary for somebody from his background. Mm -hmm. If you haven't come across Dr. Ambedkar's work, it's so inspiring. I mean, really, kind of... I'm sure, you know, people would find him really, really interesting and inspiring. Anyway, he, know, he came to understand that the roots of the caste system which was causing systemic suffering throughout India, uh, was a state of mind. That was his great realisation, that the root of caste lay in the mind, and that therefore to change that, you needed to change the mind. His, his big statement was what the mind creates, the mind can undo. So that really struck me as well as something that, you know, we can't just work on the systemic level, but at the same time you need to work on the shift of consciousness working on sort of different levels at the same time. So he, in 1936, decided that he would leave Hinduism and he began a search for another religion. Uh, he had definite criteria for this search. Uh, he wanted a new religion to enshrine the principles of liberty, equality and fraternity and something that would utterly reject caste. At the same time, it had to be compatible with reason and science and not enjoying, not just blind belief in supernatural agencies. And whatever else it might justify, it could not justify poverty. That was one of his um, 
you know, sometimes religion can be used to justify all sorts of things. So he, I mean, cut a long story short, he, in 1956, chose to take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha and convert to Buddhism. One of the things that interested me when I read about him was that his choice had come down to Marxism or Buddhism. So for me, that was quite an interesting one because I would have said my religion, in a way, was communism before I, I met the Dharma. Um, although already at that point, communism was becoming very... Uh, well, state communism was obviously causing suffering. So... But uh, I certainly would have put myself in that kind of camp. So I was quite interested that this person had kind of weighed up those and decided that Buddhism had the answer to, to that suffering. So he converted in October 1956 uh, with about half a million of his followers, 400,000 of his followers at the same time. Uh, I mean, there's loads you could say about him. And I mention him really to show that that there's, there's inspiration there for the idea that Buddhism can actually affect social change, that it isn't just a path of personal development. So Dr. Ambedkar believed that social real reform could only come from a change in mental attitude and that the Dharma could offer the best basis for a change of heart and mind. So in a way, that was my man that is my manifesto. I think that, you know, that's why at the end of the day... I've chosen to dedicate my life for quite a long time now to the path of the Dharma rather than the path of politics. Um, he believed, Dr. Ambedkar believed that a truly just society, the Dharma was the basis for a truly just society. So, so my plan is to convert the world to the Dharma. Yeah. That's not to say to convert the world to Buddhism necessarily, but to the principles that the Dharma underlies, that, that the underlying principles of the Dharma. So coming to a rather more modern Buddhist, who I also find very inspiring, is Bhikkhu Bodhi, who some of you have come across. He's a, I think he's German by birth, Bhikkhu Bodhi, but he lives in the States, and he's very much into social reform and social change. And uh, something of him that I found very interesting and quite inspiring was um, something he wrote, I think it was in The Lion's Roar, I can't quite remember, it was about five or six years ago. He says, I believe if we as Buddhists are to adequately respond to the needs of our age, we will have to rise to the challenge. It won't suffice for us merely to adopt Buddhist teachings as a route to self-fulfilment. A predominantly personal approach to spiritual growth falls far short of Buddhism's ethical ideals and misses half its message. Greed, hatred and delusion are not only in our mind, but in the food we eat, the gas we put into our cars and the movies we turn to for entertainment. I love that sentence. I should just read it again because it's very good. <laughs> Greed, hatred and delusion are not only in our mind, but in the food we eat, the gas we put into our cars and the movies we turn to for entertainment. So the, how we are is affected by the world around us, and we affect the world around us, and there's no getting away from that, really. He goes on to say, The Buddha taught the Dharma on the basis of a far-reaching vision that pierced the depths of suffering in both its personal and collective dimensions. He offered his teaching not only as a method to tame the mind, but as a standard for ennobling us in all dimensions of our being, the social, political and economic. His discourses on lay ethics, communal harmony and even the duties of a king are testimony to his panoramic awareness. So the Buddha, I mean there's lots, I probably don't have time in a talk like this, but there are suttas in the Pali Canon where the Buddha uses um, the law of conditionality to analyse not only how we end up personally creating suffering, <coughs> but also how society creates suffering. Um, there's one which I really like, which uh, talks about this king who... Th there's lots of rice, and the king's distributing rice, and everybody in the kingdom is fed. 
And then some people in the kingdom start thinking, what if there isn't any rice next year? So they start to hoard the rice. And then because they start to hoard it, there's less for other people. So then rice becomes a commodity that's much more valuable. So then people start to steal the rice because it's a valuable commodity. And the way the sutta goes, it says something like, um, and then poverty gives rise to stealing. Stealing gives rise to knives and something like that, I can't quite remember which which gives rise to killing and murder, and there you go. And again, it goes round, and it's like, yeah, there's something, mm. you know, it isn't just on a personal kind of level. So um, one of the reasons why I, I gave that this talk a while back and why I thought maybe I'd share it with people here, I have no idea whether this is true for anybody in this room, but I sometimes wonder if Western Buddhism is overly inward-looking. I'm sure it's not true of anybody in this room, actually. <laughs> but I think a lot of people, you know, I think sometimes Western Buddhism, particularly in Europe, which is where I'm more familiar with it, in the UK in particular, but also in the States, where I do know quite a bit about how the USA, those states, um, I do think sometimes Buddhism becomes a palliative tool for living life better. Almost a way of dealing with the suffering in life without really dealing with the suffering in life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think mindfulness teaching is fantastic and I think it's wonderful that it gets Buddhist principles out to people who would probably never walk into a Buddhist centre. And I think teaching mindfulness, particularly in terms of people who are suffering, whether it's physically or mentally, emotionally, I think is a bodhisattva act. I think it's something we can offer and I think Buddhism has a good take on mindfulness and can offer it. And I sometimes wonder if it doesn't then become something to help us all live in samsara better without really changing anything very sort of drastically. So sometimes I think what we end up is an, the idea that Buddhism is either contemplative or activist. And I don't think it needs to be either or. For me, Buddhism offers both. And that's one of the things about the Dharma which I find very attractive. When I was a child, I was very attracted to becoming a Catholic nun. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I used to worry as a sort of seven or eight-year-old about which order I would join <laughs> within the Catholic Church. Because I was very attracted in two directions. I was very attracted to the contemplative orders, but I was also very attracted to what's known as the apostolic orders, for any of you that are ex-Catholics, uh, or possibly still Catholics, I don't know. Um, the apostolic are the ones that go out and preach and teach, and they're missionaries. So I had aunties who were both of those things. I came from a very religious family. So I had an auntie who was uh, the mother superior, actually, which was the deputy mother superior of a, co a convent that was enclosed. So we'd only see her, this was in the 60s, through the grill, which I thought was terribly romantic and exciting. <laughs> so I, I had these fantasies of swishing about behind the grill in my habit, <laughs> in the autumnal sort of leaf kind of swishing around my long habits. But I, I didn't really think that's what I was going to do. So I had another auntie who was a missionary. She'd been, a, she'd trained as a, a doctor actually and then had her vocation just before she finished her medical training and went off to Africa to be a missionary and work as a, a doctor in Africa. And she used to come home and tell us these great stories of things that she'd seen and uh, found. So I was very inspired by that to go out and convert the natives to Catholicism <laughs> and save their lives as well. It was a very patronising sort of view of the world, but you know, there was something in it which was also genuinely, I think, yeah. kind of compassionate within the, the framework that I had to my, at my fingers. So for me, that I think that split can be a split in people between the contemplative or meditative and the more active in the world. 
And I think one of the things that means that the Dharma can help with suffering in a collective sense is that we don't need to choose between those. And that in actual fact, they're both needed to be part of a whole. You know, I think very much that's how Sangharach has founded our particular community. And that's very much been the basis of our community, that in a way the contemplative side is important. We need retreats, we need meditation. And it might even be that some people will dedicate themselves more fully to that. But for our order and community to be whole, there also needs to be action in the world. But of course, if you just have action in the world, then if it isn't based on a calm, contemplative kind of approach, then certainly for me, my default position would be rage and anger. You know, that's how I would respond to what I see around me as suffering if I didn't have something that gave me values that were more contemplative. So what you know what you find in the world these days is something called engaged Buddhism. And that's quite an interesting term and it's quite a controversial term, the idea of engaged Buddhism, because some would argue that any Buddhism must be engaged, that there's no need to have a specific category of engaged Buddhism. On the other hand, it's quite an interesting way of looking at how Buddhism might approach societal kind of issues or problems. Uh, Dr. Ambedkar himself actually didn't talk about um, engaged Buddhism, but he talked about what he called Navayana Buddhism, which was a new vehicle, yana being vehicle. So you have the Hinayana, which is a very derogatory term, the Mahayana, the Vajrayana, different um, iterations of the Dharma through, through the ages. And he su suggested that what was now needed was a new yana, mm -hmm. which... Uh, was, has been picked up by various people and talked about as a fourth turning of the wheel of the Dharma, as a kind of like responding to the very particular issues that the 21st century, or the 20th century, because that's when it was coined, really, might give us. So there are questions that I think, um, as somebody who, any of us who reflect in the world, will come across issues that we'll find... I would imagine, distressing. You know, there's poverty, discrimination, environmental issues, which is one of the very big ones. And some people would argue it's the basic underlying issue, that if we don't sort that out, then we won't have a world to worry about in, you know, not very far in the future. Um, so it seems to me that those issues are sometimes described as political. And I think that's because... Often we think, or people argue, that you need a political response to them. I would argue they're not political questions, they're moral questions. That one might have a political response to them, but actually they're moral issues, they're ethical issues, and just human issues rather than religious issues. So I think we can apply a dharmic analysis to these issues, I've mentioned greed, hatred and delusion. The Buddha taught that 2,500 years ago as the basic underlying issues, problems, poisons, as he described them, which give rise to problems in the world, they give rise to suffering. We suffer individually and in a broader sense because we're driven by the forces of greed, hatred and delusion. Those forces are not just within the mind of the individual but they are also embodied in the group or embodied in society. They come from ego clinging. The Buddha's basic analysis is that the problems that we cause, the problems that are caused around us are caused by us clinging to a sense of ego, a sense of privilege in the sense that I am the centre of the universe, which we all of us believe, even if we try not to. It's not, that's just how we're made up. There's nothing intrinsically bad or evil about that. The problem is what we do with that, whether we actually see it as something to be broken through and overcome, or whether we're happy just to accept that that's how life is, that I am the centre of the universe. So that ego clinging, in a way, is what um, David Loy, who some of you will have read, talks about not only ego clinging, but we go clinging, the ego and the we go. Yeah which I think is really quite good, actually. So when we build up from the individual ego, we start to put it together with other egos that 
have the same set of values as us or the same views as us. You know, and uh, Sangrachta, I think when Sangrachta has lost teachings, actually, I don't think you hear much about it anymore, is the idea of the group, um, the, com- the, the group and the spiritual community, the group, the individual and the spiritual community. And it's actually a very interesting analysis of the way the world works. Uh, the idea that we, we, you know, we're so conditioned in many ways and we're conditioned by the groups that we've been conditioned into, you know. I'm Scottish. I can remember distinctly the first time I felt okay about England doing well in a football tournament (laughs) in the World Cup. I can remember it well. I know where I was sitting. I know what I was watching the telly, and England were doing quite well. And I found myself thinking, "Well, they're playing really well," which might not sound like much, but believe me, it was a major breakthrough in national conditioning. (laughs) <laughs> the Scots are well known for supporting two teams, Scotland and anybody playing against England. I see there's a few Irish people here and I know they know what I'm talking about. So, you know, the, we do have those conditions and they go really quite deep. And again, it's, there's nothing evil necessarily about that. But it's like if, I'm, if I allow myself to be stuck in that, then actually I am separating myself out. And I'm, you know, I'm creating an us and them, which isn't actually necessary, and in fact isn't even true. You know, these are completely arbitrary divisions that we make up. And, um, yeah, so Sangha actually talks very much about part of the work of becoming uh, more individual through our practice of Buddhism is to start to see through those group conditionings and start to kind of really work against where the ego has clustered in those sort of group settings. Um, But of course, it's not like there's this group and it's bad, and then I start to practice Buddhism and I become an individual, and then I join with other people and we become this very positive (laughs) spiritual community with nothing of the group in it. I mean, if only... But it's not like that, is it? Because we all carry those things within us. And the Sangha, the spiritual community, is a group. Unless, and except when it's driven by the values of a spiritual community. So really any spiritual community, any Sangha, is going to be a mixture of group values and individual values. And it's going to be a mixture. And at our best, we're going to be driven by love by compassion, by kindness, by clarity, etc., etc. And at our worst, we're going to be driven by greed, hatred and delusion. And that's the kind of, you know, that's the battle that we fight through, you know. And it's very easy for very beautiful values to become hijacked by the group as well. So, you know, in a way, I think it's just something we need to kind of keep keep aware of. So when I talk about the idea of Buddhism affecting um, contemporary society or challenging the norms and the the views of contemporary society, I'm not necessarily thinking of converting the entire world to Buddhism or even a bit of the world to Buddhism. It's not really to do with that. It's more to do with creating a world affected by Buddhist values. And of course there's permeability between society and the world and the Buddhist community. They know that, you know, you don't come through the door of the Buddhist centre, shut the door and then suddenly you're free of all group values. That'd be good. (laughs) Um, And I think as well there's a lot that we can learn from the contemporary analysis of world issues. You know, I don't you know, I kind of worry sometimes that we might end up in a little bubble where, you know, We've found the Dharma, so we're all right, thank you very much. And the Dharma in itself is going to change everything. You know, I think there's a lot to learn about analyses of things around race, gender, the alphabet of what used to be LGBT, Mm -hmm. which was fairly straightforward to remember, but now seems to be much more complex. LGBTQI+, I believe, is the latest that I've seen. Um inclusivity, all those sort of things. 
I think it's, you know, there's a lot to be learned from some of the cultural and social analyses of the problems that arise when we over-identify with any one of those things mm -hmm. and see them as hierarchical in the sense of us and them. And, they, you know, as I say, we do it. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I don't really know quite enough about the politics here, although my main source of, of Australian politics is First Dog on the Moon. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, that's what it is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a cartoon yeah. that's re reproduced in The Guardian in the UK, and that's my main understanding of Australian <laughs> politics. <laughs> that and having lived with Vidya Tara for five years, <laughs> it's given me a very particular view of Australian <laughs> politics. Um, but certainly Europe is swinging and has swung horrendously to the right over the last five or more years. Even li very liberal countries, I don't mean liberal in the sense of your liberal party, but liberal in the, with a small L, countries like Sweden have brought back very, very right-wing, fundamentalist, hard-line politicians in a way that they haven't since before the last war, the Second World War. Hungary, Poland, most of these countries have swung to the right. Britain's in a mess, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> God. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> it's completely in a mess. It's, um, I don't know if you saw the news today, but Theresa May did in fact manage to survive and hold on to her premiership. But I think she did it by about like 30 votes or something. It's, it's, there's no way she's ever going to be able to do anything. Anyway, I'm seriously a bit worried about the state of the world. Um, you know, and in a way, Brexit concerns me not just because of the effect it has on um, you know, freedom of movement around Europe, but the fact that most people who voted for Brexit, voted to leave the European Union, did so because of absolutely false information. I mean, it, you know, it's, I'm not just saying that because I'm politically a little bit to the left. But because that it has become very obvious since the, the referendum a couple of years ago that actually most of the information that was given out was completely false. You know, like it was absolutely targeted to fear. It's like that's the basis of a lot of politics these days is fear. That's why pe the, the whole rise of populism, popularism in politics is basically appealing to the fear of people and it's the fear of other, whether that other is immigrants who are going to come and take your job off you. Uh, <laughs> there's a comedian from Glasgow called Frankie Boyle mm -hmm. who's a bit on the crude side, it has to be said. <laughs> but it's quite funny. Anyway, one of his jokes after Brexit, if I may share with you, was he, he said, well, you know... You have to understand why people are worried about, you know, like they went to get out of Europe because they're worried about all these Pakistanis coming and taking their jobs off them. That's very funny. <laughs> Doesn't strike you as funny? Pakistan's not in Europe. <laughs> Maybe that was just a bit of information. <laughs> anyway. So... <laughs> So it's fear of other a lot of the time that's driving the kind of decisions that have been made politically. I mean, let's not even go near Trump. Let's not even go there. But, you know, again, popularism, fear of, fear of other, fear of losing what we've got. And what happens then is it, it's, there's a scarcity mentality that grows up. This idea that somebody's going to take my job or take away my food or it's back to the race. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. of course, there's well more than enough to go around. But because we, you know, our whole society is based so much on a consumerist mentality where we just need more. And if I need more, then somebody else has to have less. It's obvious. And if that other person that's going to have less is going to come and take some of my more away from me, then I'm going to have less. And oh, my God, we can't have that because what's going to happen? You know, it's like panic, panic, panic. 
So we're just going to get rid of all these immigrants that are going to take my job. So we're going to get rid. We're not going to let any refugees anywhere near us. And even that, the huge refugee crisis that there is at the moment, right through the world, it's the biggest it's ever been. There's more people displaced at the moment in the world than there was in the two world wars put together. It's a huge, huge thing. And that's coming from scarcity. That's coming from a fear of, um, you know, like resources. And even that you can take back to things like climate change where resources are actually being, you know, waters become scarce in some places and it's become overly, you know, available in other places as in flooding. You know, like even just here, you know, the fires that you've had in the last few years, the flooding that's happening, it's kind of happening around the world. And when that happens, things become scarce. It's the law of conditionality. And as things become scarce, then more people are worried about not having what they need. And then that's being played upon. And then it's leading to all sorts of dreadful decisions being made, it seems to me. Anyway... Um, so I think there's a lot we can learn from current analysis of some of these issues and problems. Therapeutic approaches, I think there's a lot Buddhism has learned from psychotherapeutic approaches to the mind. I think there's a lot we can learn that, I think a lot was learned from feminism. I think a lot was learned from Western philosophical uh, analysis. And it's interesting when you think about when Buddhism came to the West. I mean, it mainly came to the West in the 70s, 60s and 70s, which was a time when a lot of these feminism and analysis of society were really kind of taken off. So I think all of that's very good. However, just to raise a slightly cautionary note, I think the danger that we have in all of that is bringing worldly values in. So there are analyses that are useful and helpful, but we need to also be aware of the values that underlie some of them. And some of those values will not, at the end of the day, be that compatible with a Buddhist analysis. So I think it's important that we're kind of aware of that. There's a, a Pali Canon Sutta called the Dasadama Sutta, which I actually did study on that here in the old centre in time. I think some of you here were at that. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, and it's ten things that one must reflect upon uh, as one goes forth from the world. So going forth being that sense of leaving behind those worldly values. And the first to them is, um, I must no longer live by worldly aims and values. And that's, like, I think that's a really important thing to kind of bear in mind. So it's not just that the Dharma and Buddhism is another way of looking at society and kind of resolving the world's problems. It's much deeper than that. It's actually saying worldly aims and values are never going to lead to anything except suffering, end of, full stop. That's what the Dharma is saying. It's saying the analysis needs to go deeper than the kind of current issues. It needs to go much deeper than that and say, well, basically greed, hatred and delusion are what drives us and what needs to be kind of uprooted both uh, individually and collectively. And one of the wondrous things about the Dharma and the wonderful thing about our community, if we really take it seriously, is we can offer what the Buddha called a fourth sight. We can offer alternatives. There are alternative ways of living. We do not need to buy Christmas presents. <laughs> <laughs> or if you do... You don't actually need to spend your entire fortune on buying a few baubles that will not, you know. We're so driven. I mean, I'm, I'm not immune to this myself. I'm currently trying to decide whether I'm going to buy a new iPhone. <laughs> I'm driven by, you know... essential <laughs> So we all of us, but I think it's important to also think we can offer alternatives. There are alternative ways of living. The third precept um, of the five precepts that we chant, uh, the positive aspect of it is with contentment. What's it, what is it in English? With tranquility, stillness, stillness, stillness simplicity, simplicity, and contentment. 
that's right. It's not tranquility, that's in Spanish. Mm. It's, uh, yeah. So simplicity <clears throat> and contentment are very, very radical and powerful um, mm. values. And to the extent that we can live to, by those values, I think we will have an influence. You know, to the extent that we can actually break the cycle of need more, need more, need more, keep away, keep away, keep away, don't threaten what I've got, then I think we really can offer alternatives. So in 1976, Sangre Akshita, their founder, gave a talk called Evolution or Extinction, a Buddhist view of current world issues, which is one of the first talks that I heard. I got involved in 1977, and I heard this talk quite soon afterwards, and I was very struck by it. Uh, so I'm going to read you a quote from that. It's kind of longish, but I think it's you know it's quite an important quote for me. So he's taught. He's spent um, quite a bit of time talking about the different world issues that you might bump into, like poverty, war. He talks about the environmental crisis, actually, which in 1976 was relatively forward sighted. And he says, "Well, quite often we just try to forget all this. We say it's just too bad. There's nothing I can do about it. So why worry? I'll just try to forget." So we close the newspaper, we switch off the television set and we just get on as best as we can with our own personal lives. We try to forget current world problems. We try to forget the problems of other people and with a greater or less degree of hedonism just get on with our own personal lives. Now in my opinion, this is still Sangrachta, in my opinion thinking this over this attitude of retreating from the problems, retreating into the personal in a rather narrow sense, is not an attitude worthy of a human being, of one who's trying to be a human being in the full sense of the term. It represents an abdication of responsibility. And we can say that a consideration of current world problems makes it clear we have before us only two alternatives. On the one hand, there's what we might call evolution, the higher evolution, spiritual development. That's one alternative. And the other alternative is extinction. This means that we, the human race, must develop spiritually or sooner or later we will perish. It's quite strong. Quite strong. So he goes on to say, uh, so in a situation or even a predicament like this, what should one do? What should each of us do? This is a question I've certainly asked myself from time to time. And it's because I've asked myself this question I'm giving this talk this, this evening and expressing the views that I am expressing. In my view, at this very highly critical juncture of human history, every thinking human being can and should do four things. So what I'm going to tell you now briefly are what those four things are. So that was Sangrachta uh, saying, and, and I think one of the things that I appreciated when I read that, or I heard the, the tape lecture was, it wasn't just that, oh my God, everything's bloody awful. There were, you know, things that one can do. I always liked that. I quite like the idea that there are things that we can do. So the four things that Sangrachta suggested were Find a method of spiritual development because if we don't change greed, hatred and delusion within ourselves then we are part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Secondly, he says, find a community that will support those values or create a community that will support those values because it's very, very hard to do it on your own. In fact, I think it's impossible to do it on your own. In some ways, the forces that we are working against are so strong and all pervasive that one little individual trying to kind of work against those forces will find it really very hard. So the second thing was find a community that supports your uh, desire for growth. The third thing he said was withdraw your energy from all the forces that are working against those values. And then the fourth thing is where you cannot withdraw your energy influence. So method of personal development, find a community, 
withdraw your energy from the forces of the dark. <laughs> we didn't say it about that. <laughs> and where you can't withdraw influence. So they're the four kind of things that I think I, I personally try to live my life by. And I think they do actually give, um, give quite a strong indication of things that we can do. So the thing about forming or joining a community... I found another quote from Bhikkhu Bodhi, which was just after the, night, the, the election where Trump had just been uh, elected into uh, the presidency of one of the world's most influential and powerful nations. Anyway, <laughs> so Bhikkhu Bodhi says, We're entering a turbulent time when it won't be enough to merely adopt the Dharma as a regimen of resilience a means of maintaining our inner balance against the shock waves rippling across the social landscape. We need a bolder agenda, a programme of collective resistance inspired by a radically different vision of human interconnection, one that affirms our duty to respect and care for one another and to maintain a habitable planet for generations yet unborn. So I think community means finding people who are willing to work alongside us. I don't think it just means Tree Ratna, for example, or just, you know, a local kind of little group of people, but a global, I think there's a need for a global community of people who understand that the issues in the world are not going to be resolved on their own level and where we really think we can uh, support each other to work against the values that are driving the planet mm. into oblivion. Um, he goes on to say, I think this is quite interesting, we may have to establish a Buddhist advocacy group, a pan-Buddhist alliance grounded in the recognition that hot political disputes are also burning ethical issues in which we must take a stand. So I quite like that. So I have to say as well, for the sake of full disclosure and transparency, not everybody in Tree Ratna would agree with that. And prob probably not everybody in this room would agree with that. And that's absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine. We don't actually all need to go to the barricades. You know, there are other ways of fighting greed, hatred and delusion. And we need to find the way that works for us. But I do think that the world's issues are strong enough, deep enough, problematic enough for it to be worthwhile, those of us who do feel that we want to advocate for a different way of being, to really take a stance. And withdraw, I mean, withdrawing means all sorts of things, doesn't it? You know, if going back to Bhikkhu Bodhi's other quote about the gas that we put in our car and the food that we eat, every choice that we make has an effect. The choices of how we live our life, where we purchase... You know, you purchase something here, it's having an effect in another part of the world. So, you know, just all of those decisions are no longer personal decisions. They're decisions that will affect the world. So withdrawing from where we can see harm being done and trying to actually uh, minimise the harm that we do. And influencing, and I think that's the one that's quite interesting. I think it's actually quite easy to influence. We might only be able to influence in a very small circle, but that small circle will then also influence other circles, and other circles and other circles outwards, so that in the end, I do believe, I'm a true believer, <laughs> that we can actually affect change in the world. That's what I truly believe, that the actions that we do will have an effect. So that's all fantastic. Are there any dangers to all this? Well, I've kind of mentioned a few. Um, I think one of the big dangers is the secularisation of the Dharma. That, you know, the Dharma is something that goes beyond a humanistic, secular approach. There is a transcendent element to the Dharma. There's something bigger and beyond the material. And I think if that perspective is not present, then also we're not going to be... We need to overcome um, working just on the same level. Otherwise, we just fall into the same kind of issues. And I think sometimes there's a, a desire to make the Dharma available 
which is wonderful, that ends up being an almost a dumbing down of the Dharma, a kind of oversimplification of things. And, you know, I, I see that sometimes in modern Western Buddhism. And I actually put this in here because of where I gave the talk initially, because I was talking to other Buddhist teachers from other movements, and some of them, and some of the particular movements that they were from, I think, do do that a little bit. Uh, yeah. So, and I think the democratization, if that's a word, a word of the Dharma, is also a danger. There is a hierarchy of consciousness, and as one develops, then hopefully one's consciousness becomes more refined. And to not allow somehow for that, I think, can also bring be a danger. So I'm going to leave you with some questions that you can do for homework. Mm-hmm. How do we deal with current world issues without buying into current world views? That's the big question. Really. I don't have an answer to that. I just think it's a question that needs to be kept alive. And I think to the extent that any of us here, any of us in Sri Ratna, <laughs> decide that we do want to act in the world in a particular way, where we do feel we want to withdraw and, and influence then I think that's the question that has to underlie our actions. Does it, are we just buying into current world values or are we actually influencing by our, our dharmic values? Another question is, what are the dangers of engaging in kind of activism? You know, for me, there are personal dangers in engaging with activism, which are to do with my peace of mind. They're just to do with my mental states. You know, I think I said earlier, my default position is anger. Some people's default position is despair. I never get to the despair. There might well be despair under the anger, but I get stuck at the anger. You know, and it can, ra- it can range from mild irritation at some of the things that I see to absolute and utter rage and the desire to smash the system. You know, so for me it's important that I don't just fall into those states because actually what bloody good would that do anybody? You know, I was one of these people that used to stand at street corners and shout at people <laughs> on behalf of world peace. <laughs> <laughs> You're the problem! <laughs> anyway, so I have to work with those kind of mental states. That's the dangers for me. It might be different for other... It will be different for other people. And the last big question I'm going to leave you with and end is, what can we as Buddhists offer the suffering world. Thank you. Mm-hmm.